Uh, Leslie, is it Geisler? Geisler Munger was sworn in as state controller. Free choice, right? <laughs> yes, she was. Okay. Um, just so we get that clear, there was no, you know, uh, no kidnapping involved or anything like that. Uh, uh, in January, uh, she's a graduate of the University of Illinois. For all you fighting Illini, give her a big askiwawa. There you go. We'll skip that other degree from that school north of here. Um, but all that can be said and done, of all the things she's done, this has got to be the most courageous thing. Uh, stepping into the breach, I told her, and, and I'll share the line, and she, she'll, she'll say, no, it's not. But sort of like after the iceberg, taking over for the captain of the Titanic. Uh, she's in charge. Uh, with all the power that's vested in the controller's office, which as you know is monumental, and we are very fortunate to have with us today a, a person who's been going around talking about the basic facts of what's facing the state of Illinois. So with that, I am honored to present Leslie Geisler Munger, Controller, State of Illinois. Thank you, everyone. It's really so thrilled to be here uh, to talk to all of you today. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, there have been a lot of firsts since I have been uh, the comptroller for the state. Uh, I've had my first swearing in. I've had my first uh, Blue Room press conferences and my first uh, being attacked by the, the media with questions and questions and, and like a firing squad. Uh, I've had uh, the first time I've been sued. Uh, <laughs> I've uh, been at my first state fair and uh, a lot, a lot of firsts. So I'm uh, really happy to add another one here uh, to be here at the City Club the first time speaking. And I really appreciate it. Thank you very much to the City Club President Jay Doherty for inviting me to be here today. I, um, it's been crazy the last nine months. I was actually on the radio last week with Ro Khan on WGN in the afternoon. And he said, uh, so hey, uh, would, would you have run for office if you had really known what you were getting yourself into? <laughs> I said, you know, really, I, I stepped back. I really had to think about that. I said, it really, um, honestly, had I, I never thought I would be standing here. And actually, if you would have asked me as recently as January 1st, if I would be standing here as a state officer talking to all of you here today, I just never have believed it. Uh, because I am really new to state government. I, I spent my career in the private sector. I'm not from the, I don't have a political background. I spent my career at McKinsey and Company, and at, at Procter and Gamble, and at Helene Curtis. At Helene Curtis, I led brands you've probably used in your own home: Suave Shampoo, Vanessa Conditioner, Degrading Perspirant. Uh, eventually, I was responsible for the $800 million U.S. hair care business there. So I had to remind Ro that uh, I didn't even run for comptroller. All, all I did, sitting at home on a Saturday morning, was answer my cell phone, and uh, the governor's office was on the other end of it. And, and now, in hindsight, had I known that uh, what he was calling about, I might have thought twice about answering that phone. Because uh, it's really been a crazy, a crazy nine months for our family and really in the state. Uh, a lot of people who didn't even know what the comptroller did or um, who she was certainly knows now. As you've probably seen over the past several weeks, I've really tried to use the platform of my office to really um, highlight the, the consequences, the very serious consequences that are happening in our state right now as, con as we continue to operate our state without a budget. And in sounding that warning, I've tried to take a page out of the playbook of my predecessor um, and dear friend who I know many people here in this room, the late Judy Bartopinka. Judy would always ask, uh, hey, how are we going to pay for that? And um, I think certainly was the, one of the first ones to call out when she thought the numbers just weren't adding up. And so um, I think if she were here in this room today, I'm not exactly sure what she would say, but I'm sure she'd be, she'd be giving somebody an earful because um, our state right now is really on a bad path. Um, the realities of our budget today are frankly staggering. Because of our state's failure to pass a balanced budget for the beginning of the fiscal year that started on July 1st, we are now paying bills for our state under more than a dozen court orders, consent decrees, and a series of continuing appropriations. And when you add all those together, we are currently funding about 90% of the things covered for our state under last year's budget. Everything from Medicaid and social services to debt, pensions, salaries, and that 
actually, when you think about it, for no budget, that all sounds kind of good. And at least we're getting a lot of things done in our state. You know, shouldn't we be paying people for the services that they provide? The problem is that we don't have the money to back up what we are supposed to be paying. And in fact, our revenues this year are expected to be down 18%, and actually roughly $2.4 billion just in the first six months of our fiscal year alone. Shouldn't really be a surprise that we're in this situation because we all know that the temporary tax sunset last January, and so we're actually bringing in less money. Normally, you'd have spending reductions when you have revenue uh, declines occur, but we have not done that. We've just continued to spend at last year's rates. So today, we find ourselves in the position that we are being directed by the courts to write checks with no relation to what we actually have in our, in our state's bank accounts. And to quote Rich Miller, it's like oh, thinking... <laughs> he had a great line on it, actually. I thought, you know, I'm going to use this. Um, he said, it's like thinking we have money in the bank in our bank account just because we still have checks, plenty of checks in our checkbook. And that's exactly the way I think. There's been all sorts of comments about, well, I don't know why they're not paying these bills. There's plenty of money in the bank account. Really, anyone who could look at a multi-billion dollar backlog in our state and think that we have money in our bank account doesn't understand you know, how to manage a checkbook very well. So, you know, unfortunately, the numbers that we have really speak for themselves in the state. At the end of August, we ended August with a backlog of bills, those are unpaid bills in the states, to schools, to businesses, to hospitals, social service agencies, others that totaled $5.5 billion, $5.5 billion. Now here we are just a few weeks later, the middle of September, we're at $6 billion. And if we continue on this track of spending more money than we have, um, we bring into the state month by month, we will end our year with a total bill backlog of roughly $8.5 billion. And these are bills just piling up. This doesn't count any of our pension debt or anything else. Mm -hmm. Importantly, that's only for the 90% of the state that we're actually funding. So there's another 10% that we're not even considering right now. We're not processing those payments because we don't have a budget in place to process them. Those are things that include spending for higher education, uh, student MAP grants, social service agencies that don't fall under the various consent decrees that we're covering. Uh, retiree employee health insurance benefits, um, the lottery, which we've all heard uh, a lot about. I see it on the national news all around the country because no one can believe that Illinois is not paying its lottery uh, winners. And, and the total of those bills are $4.3 billion on an annual basis. So if you add up where we could be at the end of this calendar year, $8.5 billion in unpaid bills with the 4.3 you can see that we are looking at a potential bill backlog that is extremely deep. And we are digging a hole so deep in this budget right now that if we don't do something quickly, it is going to be very difficult for us to get out of it. Those who are hurt most by this budget impasse right now are, frankly, those who can least afford it. And I, I know there are a number of people here in the audience today, friends of mine, um, I've met with throughout the year. These are people who run our social service organizations. These organizations uh, do great work for our state, and they are currently operating going forward without a budget. They continue on not knowing if they're going to get their appropriation at all, or if they do, what, how much it will be. They wonder if the, when we get a budget in place, will they be reimbursed for the services that they've provided. They've tapped out their lines of credit. Some of them are frankly looking at the very real possibility of having to shut their doors. When we talk about the realities facing these organizations, it's really personal for me. Uh, my husband, John, and I have a nephew who's autistic. And we've seen firsthand how difficult it is for families in these situations. And for the past 15 plus years, and long before I ever had anything to do in state government, I have served uh, as a volunteer and a board of directors member at an organization in Lincolnshire where we live uh, called the Riverside Foundation. It's a home for developmentally and intellectually disabled adults. And I lived through those years when the state was um, a year behind and a million dollars in arrears paying Riverside. And we were taking out loans in our organization to buy food and to pay for medical care for the people that we served. So I know firsthand how difficult it is uh, the, for these organizations and how hard it is uh, for them to continue on with this budget impasse and not getting paid. 
It's important for us to help these organizations because they help our state. They serve these people at a much lower cost. For every one person we take care of at the state, these nonprofits can take care of five at the same cost. So they benefit our state, and instead, how do we thank them? We ask them, essentially, to float the state. This is really wrong, um, at putting them in this role, and it's really uh, something that we can and must do better. So in the short term, my office has been working every day to prioritize payments to those most in need and to ensure that we make our mandatory payments and don't defet our default on our debt, our payroll, our retirement system payments, because all these payments must be made under the law. We're in continuing uh, constant communication with these nonprofits and social service organizations, those that are serving our most needy in our state. And I've met with leaders of these organizations all throughout our state uh, as I've uh, traveled the state these past several months in my role as comptroller. We work hard to forecast cash flows, to stage our payments. On big payments, we have to accrue cash for a number of days to save up the money so we have enough to make those big Medicaid payments or payments into the pension funds. And we are basically, in my group, I think doing everything we can possibly do, working as hard as we can to pay everything we can as fast as we can. But I think we could all agree as we look at the situation in our state, there's really no way to run the state. Beyond this short-term things that we can do, we must begin to work our way away from the edge of this fiscal cliff that we are currently on because it is costing our state dearly. Uh, I mentioned I've traveled all over the state, and I live in Lake County, and so uh, I live in a border county, and any of us who live anywhere near the Illinois border have seen friends and businesses pick up and move just over the border to a place, another place, where they can have a more competitive business environment and lower tax burden. Our children move away because they cannot find their best jobs in their home state anymore. Our, those who most need it, our most vulnerable, are at the risk of being unfunded. We're paying millions of dollars in late fees just because we pay our bills so late. And in fact, this past year, just in fees, not in interest or anything else, we paid over $50 million in 2014 uh, in late fees because we are behind on our bills. Think about that. I know that there's a lot of social service organizations right here in this room who could spend that money much better than wasting it because of our, in, um, our really inexcusable financial practices. We're really not serving anyone well. And we need to bring back a state that keeps its promises, lives within its means, and provides a better value for all of us in Illinois who live here. So, so what do we do and how do we do that? And I will say that I have a number of press conferences. At every press conference I've had, inevitably someone will ask me, well, what if we just put that temporary tax increase back in place? Can't we just go back up to 5% again? Wouldn't that really solve a lot of our problems? And I wish I could say it would. It would be really nice if it were really that simple. But the problems that we have in Illinois right now and the challenges are really so much greater than that. First is honestly just the simple reality of the math. With the bill backlog uh, that I was talking about before, a potential $12.8 billion when you add the bill backlog plus the $4.3 billion that we are not currently funding at all, we are looking at um, $12.8 billion in unfunded and unpaid bills going into the beginning of the fiscal year. Based on our recent history from the tax increase that we uh, just <coughs> let sunset, every one percentage point increase yields us $3.8 billion in additional tax revenue on an annual basis. And keep in mind that this year we actually have, well, we, this tax sunset, it didn't go all the way back down to 3%. We're still operating at um, a 25% increase at 3.75% is our current tax rate. So in order to make up a 12 to $13 billion gap in our budget, we would need to raise our state income tax over three full percentage points from our current 3.75% to actually over 7%, nearly doubling our current tax rate. 7%, just think about that for a minute. For a family uh, who, that earns $50,000 a year, that means an additional $1,500 a year just paid out in taxes alone. And even if we look to pay this down over two years instead of one, uh, we would still be looking at having to raise taxes at more than where we landed before at the 5% level with our um, temporary tax. And honestly, in reality, I think uh, if we're all honest with ourselves, 
seven percent it wouldn't be the real the real number because that assumes that our tax base stays intact and that we do not lose any more businesses and jobs to other surrounding states because of our tax situation the last time we raised taxes uh, from only two points from a 67 percent increase uh, we saw businesses and people leave and um, I think if we had to go to 7% or potentially higher, we would certainly accelerate that outflow of people and jobs. So I think you can see that it's not so easy to just raise taxes again and get out of this mess. The tax burden in our state, with uh, the, that tax burden on income tax combined with our already extremely high property taxes, our sales taxes that are what, among the highest in the country, utility taxes, gas taxes, the total burden on Illinois taxpayers is just too high and we're uncompetitive with our neighboring states. And people and businesses know that and they have choices and they can pick up and move. It really speaks, I think, to the need to take a really different approach. Now, I mentioned earlier, I spent my career in the private sector solving problems for businesses. And while I understand that uh, the government is not the same as running a business, business principles, I believe, can be applied to help solve government problems. So I'd like to share with you four principles that were important to me in my business career that I think are really highly relevant to the situations that we face today in our state. The first principle is solve the problem, not the symptom. We're in a mess today in Illinois because we have consistently taken the easy, expedient path. We solved the symptom of the problem. We did not attack the root of it. The problem in Illinois is not, <clears throat> excuse me, is not that we do not have enough tax revenue. In fact, with the temporary income tax in place, we brought in more revenue to our state than we've ever seen. Did you know that we brought in $34 billion in additional revenue over those four years? $34 billion. What happened to all that money? Wasn't that supposed to go to pay down the debt that, we are, um, the, the debt that we're looking at today? The problem, actually, is that we have an ever-growing fixed cost to our government that is gobbling up everything and is extremely expensive. We have $7 billion in pension payments that take up over 20% of our state's budget right now and are growing as a result of our pension ramp. We have $2 billion that we owe in interest on our debt as a result of borrowing to plug budget holes in the past. And that debt costs us a lot because we have the worst credit rating in the country. So every time we borrow money, we pay a lot to borrow it. We have Medicaid expenses ballooning. Over $16 billion spent this year, costing our state a net of $9 billion, or over 25% of our state's budget, after we net out the federal reimbursements that we get. These fixed costs are crowding out funding for all the other critical services of our state. Education, social services, public safety, infrastructure, are all being cut year after year to fund these growing liabilities. If you look at that that way, you'll realize that there will never be enough money to fund critical services. Until we pay down our debt, we get a constitutional solution to our pension and employee retirement health care funding crisis, and that we ensure that those who are receiving Medicaid benefits are tr those who are truly eligible. My second principle. Small savings replicated over and over again yield big savings. When I led the uh, antiperspirant business at Helene Curtis, we had just introduced degree antiperspirant. And it was off to a great start with consumers. Uh, it was going gangbusters. Big problem was we were not making any money. And so uh, my brand, we were charged with turning, making degree profitable again. We looked at everything in that product. We took out, we took the packaging apart. We looked for ways to save fractions of, of cents on our manufacturing process. We changed the formula a little bit. We actually even found a fragrance that was less expensive but preferred by consumers. We put it all together and what I learned there is that small fractions of cents added up over and over again saved us a lot of money. We made Degree Profitable. It's still out there on the shelves today, a strong, healthy, and growing brand. Applying that same approach to state government, I challenged my staff earlier this spring to cut 10% from the Comptroller's Office budget. We, uh, we looked at where we had as staff. Instead of adding back people we lost through retirements and the transition of offices, we consolidated departments. We cross-trained people. We brought outside services in-house. 
We now have the lowest headcount in Comptroller Office history, and my staff has bigger jobs and they're learning new skills. We turned back half a million dollars to taxpayers last fiscal year, and this year's budget, if we ever get one in place, uh, will show that our budget is 10% lower in fiscal 16 than it was last year. And we are still looking for more savings. Every state office and agency in our state ought to be doing that. And honestly, just to go back to the bills, if we just paid our bills on time, there's $50 million right there. Third principle, continually look for ways to do things faster, cheaper, and better, because if you don't before you know it, you will be slower, more expensive, and worse off. Government really fundamentally is a service business, and putting off investments Forgoing innovation costs, eventually costs us time and money. Right now, our payroll, human services, and uh, financial systems are out of control. We have over 400 systems right now, accounting systems in our state that manage all these things. Believe it or not, they're programmed in COBOL. And I found out when I said that, that is just code for, it is really old. Um, it takes us almost nine months to complete our financial uh, statements at the end of our fiscal year. We spend millions of dollars maintaining these systems and keeping them updated. Every individual change has to be manually overwritten. And most concerning is that those who are um, charged with maintaining these systems, who can still know how to program in COBOL, they're all retiring, that we have relatively few left in our government. So I'm really proud to say that I've, my office has been working in conjunction with the governor's chief information officer, Hardik Bott, who's here today, and I think he's speaking here at the City Club the end of uh, September. <laughs> Hardik's Hardik's team and ours have been working very hard to put in place a single cloud-based system to replace all these hundreds of systems we have. The software was purchased in fiscal 15. The implementation companies have been hired. The pilot began early July. It will take us about five years to fully roll this out in the state, but we will begin seeing savings as early as fiscal 17. And most importantly, once this is up and running, it will save our state right now an estimated half a billion dollars a year, making our government more transparent, more efficient, and importantly, more affordable. And and finally, my last principle, and that is growth is a game changer. And I know from experience that growth is going to be absolutely critical in our state if we are ever going to climb out of this financial mess that we are in. Early in my career, I led the Suave hair care business. And I'm sure uh, all of you know who Suave, what Suave is. Suave is that inexpensive brand, usually on the bottom shelf at your local grocery store, your Walgreens. That's a call to, to Donovan. Where are you, Donovan? <laughs> um, I, uh, it's, it was the flagship brand at Helene Curtis. Uh, it was a $100 million business, and it actually funded a lot of new brand development uh, at our company. But much like Illinois, Suave had experienced a number of declines over the years. And um, in, much like Illinois, again, where Illinois has consistently tried to raise taxes, Suave had, had taken a lot of price increases over the years. And frankly, that made it uncompetitive with other brands. The Mike brand team and I were charged with turning Suave around. Now, we could have taken the easy approach. We could have put in a sales promotion or two. That would have helped our sales in the short run. Uh, but it would not really have solved the underlying problem that made us uncompetitive. We could have taken our price up again, uh, and at least that would have brought in more money to help fund some of the things we needed. But we did the opposite approach. We invested in the product. We improved our formulas. We got rid of that old screw-off cap and put on a flip-top cap. We um, put in a very aggressive marketing campaign. And most importantly, we took our price down, actually 5%. I can still remember presenting this plan to my management. Our uh, division president looked at me and said, uh, you know, we're trying to make some money here. Uh, it's, uh, this is pretty aggressive. I hope you can do this. And I think uh, the really, the, but when he heard our whole plan, he said, you know what? I'll support it. And if you make those share goals, I will dance down Wall Street. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, it was about a year later, and it was a beautiful day in Chicago, when uh, the police closed off a lane on Wall Street. And the band started up, and our division president marched north across the Chicago River to the front of the Helene Curtis headquarters where there was a crowd of cheering Helene Curtis employees. Because in one year, we had taken Swap from being a $100 million brand to a $200 million brand. 
We increased our profits 80%. And Suave took leadership in the hair care category, it went from a, um, to a 10% dollar share, overtaking Pantene, which is difficult because uh, Pantene cost three times what Suave did at the time. Importantly, we sold so much Suave that we had to expand production and we had to add shifts and hire people in our plant. We uh, overflowed production out to contract manufacturers. They benefited from the growth of SWAV. And the profits from SWAV helped fund the development of degree antiperspirant. It worked because we offered a competitive product, a great product at a competitive price. And we changed people's behavior and brought them back to our brand. We solved the problem, not the symptom. Now I believe we can do that same thing here in Illinois. But it starts with balancing the budget by growing revenues, not just from continually increasing taxes, but through economic growth and growing our tax base. Through implementing reforms that will make Illinois more competitive and encourage companies and businesses to come back, stay here, invest, grow, and put people back to work. I agreed to serve as comptroller because I am an Illinoisan through and through. Um, I was born and raised in Joliet. My husband John, our sons, and I are all proud University of Illinois alums. I all out. <laughs> I earned my master's degree here in Illinois at the Kelly School of Management up in Evanston. Today, uh, John and I and our family live in Lincolnshire. We love Illinois, this is our home. And I'm here because I believe in my heart that we can get our state back on a good, strong financial track if we make decisions now with the long-term future of our state in mind. Now, I, uh, I joked at the beginning about not, maybe not wanting to answer the governor's phone call and uh, about accepting this job. But the reality is that I agreed to serve as comptroller because I just want to help our state. I'm not taking a pension. I don't need the health care benefits. I just want to help lead changes in our state that are long, long overdue. And frankly, if I can get that done, if I can make a difference in this state, I'll look forward to putting Springfield in my rear view mirror and going back to Lincolnshire uh, to be with my family and the life that I love. And uh, so um, I want to thank you all again today for having me here. It's been a really pleasure talking to you. And uh, even though this is my first time speaking at the City Club, I have been here enough for enough of the lunches that I know that now it's time for the City Club questions from the audience. <laughs> so bring them on. Well done, Thank you. Okay, we have, if you have questions, uh, pass them on. We have a early question, but the moderator, watch this, aging baby boomers, <laughs> emulating Lawrence Spivak, remember him? He always asked the first question. New, new system, Jay, I just, I just thought it up. Do you keep the actual books for the state of Illinois? Because you're, I'm the man who once said that the accountants in Springfield all went to the University of Houdini. Because everybody has different numbers. Do you have the actual numbers? I don't, but someone in my office does. I have a whole building full of accountants and actuaries who work on all this stuff. And so you send that to everybody so they all know how much money there is? We do. We actually um, we have a number of uh, reports and documents that go out routinely from the comptroller's office uh, that, that post where we are financially. All of our certified financial reports come out of our office. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, thing called uh, Fiscal Focus that's sent out. It's a newsletter. Uh, we put things on our website. So we do keep those books. I don't personally, however. All right, well, that's reassuring. Okay, here we go with the questions. Uh, I'm, boy, Shillerstrom, you're really making a comeback. Yes, Bob will be here December 14th. Oh. Uh, uh, just so. <laughs> Jay, Jay Doherty, very possessive. I know, you want to get those cuffings too. Okay, here we go. Kevin Washdell, Village of Villa Park. Where are you, Kevin, Your Honor? Okay, uh, you got a lot of questions. Let's go with the number one question. What is the likelihood of the state changing the municipal allocation of income tax? I assume the part that goes to the villages? I would assume that. Uh, you're talking about the local government right. and what comes back. 
Um, honestly, I don't know. So this is an area, as you probably know, in the, the comptroller, we, we don't get a vote on any of these things. We pay the bills for the state. Um, this is a decision that would be need, needed to be made by the legislature and the governor's office, uh, really. However, as you um, can probably tell from the comments that I just made, I don't think a lot of this micromanaging of shifting this back and forth is really that long-term answer to what we need to do. What we need, what we really need, is we need a booming economy back here in Illinois to get our top line really growing. Uh, there are a lot of things that we can do to reduce costs, I think, uh, not just in our um, in a state government, but in municipal governments. I know there are a lot of uh, things the state imposes on our municipalities that end up costing them a lot of money. And I think that whatever we do, uh, there has to be an understanding that if we um, put an additional burden on, we have to take something off to try to help keep people costs. And, and this goes really for the same for businesses, cost neutral, uh, so you can continue doing all the things that you need to do in your municipalities. It's really all one taxpayer that we're overtaxing here. And if we do something in the state that causes the um, the municipalities to have a higher, it really does not help. Okay. Bob Gallo, AARP. <laughs> Welcome to the City Club. Does the state have the money to pay the court's decision this morning to require CCP Medicaid payments to the Illinois Department of Aging Providers? That's called a sandbag. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't know about this one specifically, but I'll say that we are, um, we are paying a lot of Medicaid costs right now under federal court orders. Uh, and, and we, all the money, all these court orders and things, it's uh, already been in the news back in August, it's making it very difficult to make all these payments all at one time. Because of the Medicaid payment actually in total that we owe right now, uh, as, of, as of last week, it was about $1.2 billion for the first two months of the new fiscal year that we are ordered to pay. And we normally have somewhere around $100 million in our bank account. So you can see there's a number of days saving up to make those payments. But we are making payments to Medicaid as uh, dictated by the federal courts. And so I would imagine that th this would fall under, and it's just a question of when that full payment is made. Okay. By the way, I want you all to read uh, James Madison's Federalist Papers 10 and 51 about separation of powers. It comes, in, <laughs> comes into play a little bit. And here we go. Mark Weiermiller. Where are you, Mark? <laughs> On the right side of the room, shocking. Uh, <laughs> what are thoughts on combining? You've been in office less than a year, right? What are the thoughts on combining the treasurer and the controller office to save money? I actually think combining our two offices is a great idea. Most businesses, many other states have one chief financial officer in the state. Uh, I've said many times uh, throughout my talks as comptroller that um, that savings from that eliminates duplication. It's estimated to save about $12 million a year. And people will say, well, $12 million isn't really that much money. We're billions of dollars in debt. $12 million is a lot of money to me. And, uh, you know, again, I know there's a lot of social service organizations that like to have even a small fraction of that $12 million. So I think we ought to do it. Actually, there was legislation that was put forth a couple of years ago uh, to try and make that consolidation happen. Uh, the first step is to get it on the ballot. It would require a constitutional amendment. And so um, there was legislation to try and get it on the ballot. It passed the Senate unanimously. It uh, has not gotten out of committee in the House. And so uh, it really is stuck there. That's what has to happen. It has to be voted on. Assuming that people would vote uh, to put it on the ballot, it would be then on the ballot in 2016 to be voted on by the, Amer the uh, people of Illinois to amend our Constitution. And after that point, uh, we could work to figure out how to consolidate the two offices. How about a round of applause for our speaker? Well done.